So, yes, well, welcome, 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 welcome. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a great pleasure to be here at the center. And Angie asked me to do a lecture on the book, The Messengers. And uh, whenever I'm asked to do something in relationship to the center, I always say yes, if possible, uh, with great pleasure, because it does bring me great joy. Uh, I have been nourished so much by this particular center, and um, with all those blessings, it's, it's, yeah, I'm so happy to give whatever little I might offer. So she asked me for something specific. She asked me um, to present this book, The Messengers, and so it has a specific message, a specific purpose, and I had I had to connect to that. So thank you for that, Angie. Uh, so let us just dive in. Let's see. So I'd like to first begin by, by talking about the messenger. The messenger who brought us this book is Chico Xavier. And uh, Chico was born in, in 1910. He's uh, from Minas Gerais in Brazil, and uh, he psychographed over 442 books. And uh, from those books, he sold 50 million copies, all of which the profits have been uh, uh, given back into the charities, uh, most of which are, are spiritist related. And then in the 1960s and the 1970s, uh, something that, that gave him a little bit more notoriety was that he was featured on, a, on the TV show uh, Pinga Fogo? Yes. What does that mean? In... Dripping fire. Ah, OK. Um, and because of his mediumship uh, ability and the quality of that, uh, he became very, very popular. And so with that popularity also came uh, the recognition of, of spiritism and, and the teachings. It, you know, it's not that Chico established these teachings, but it's that you know, his participation as a messenger affected them. You're so handsome. Ah. So behold, I, I send you my messenger, and he shall prepare the way for, for, for me. What, what is it to be a messenger? What does that mean, to be a messenger? You know, when we think about that, a messenger is somebody that, that delivers something, you know, a package. It could be a, a, a communication is, is a, you know, a form of delivery. Maybe the internet is, is another form. But uh, the, the messenger, whatever that form is, has one focus, has one purpose. And uh, so that is the interesting thing. And when I think about uh, the, like what is a messenger, I think about what are the messages that uh, we're sending out in the world. And I think about the blessings that I have in my life. And I think about the gifts that have been given to me. And, and, you know, maybe you might ask yourself the, the same questions. And I think about, like, what is my message? What is my message really saying to the world? Is it about love? Is it about joy? Is it about happiness? Is it uh, a, about goodness? Is it about kindness? Is it about compassion? Or is it about fear? Is it about anger? Is it about hate? Is it about uh, limited possibilities in what I see? And in each and every single instant, we are always making a choice to deliver a message. And we are either delivering a message in love, of love, or of fear. We're choosing to deliver a message, welcome a message of faith or doubt. And, and, you know, it's just good for me when I ask myself that question because it just, it helps me to, to be aware. 
So the beautiful thing about this particular book is The Messengers um, gives us the idea of uh, the cre creation. And, 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 and one of the things that it says is, uh, ordinary men and women long for something extraordinary to, hap to happen. They forget that their nature, that nature is not concerned with satisfying their particular points of view. And physical death in itself is not an ending. It's not a beginning or an ending. It is just a uh, evolutionary step. So um, what we get to see through the eyes of the spirit, Andre Luis, who is uh, the, the spirit that uh, Chico is psychographing, is a window into the spiritual realm and what his experiences of that were and the teachings that we, we have learned from this particular book and that we learn in, in the other studies. And everything is divinely connected. I think that that is the, the bigger thing and the, the, the picture that I, I gained from the, just the introduction itself. And it opens up in the chamber of rectification. Um, and it talks about this idea of uh, he's just disincarnated. And, and so he's, he's here. And uh, one of the things that struck me was they talked about this profound joy and, and like an unexperienced uh, level of love. And when I try to imagine in my, life, in my mind what that is, of course I can't because it's not of my mind and it's not of something that I've experienced here. I, 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 I try to make reference to it in relationship to God's divine love, which I think is unconditional. And uh, joy is the result of that love. Um, he talks about liberation, you know, a sense of freeness after being released from the body, from the physical material body. But interesting that he talks about this clarity and this truth that he has. Um, and it's like his, his life on a timeline that he can see all the instances of all the relationships. And, and it's in that clarity of what he's achieved and what he's not achieved. That he's getting, getting a perspective from that type of view and the assistance and, of course, the, the transformations that are undergone. Uh, and as we move into uh, one of the, the first characters uh, is An An Anacito, and uh, he is welcoming him into the, uh, into, into the uh, the spiritual realm. And the, the thing that stood out for me in this, you know, I wanted to tell you a little bit too because I didn't like clarify this. This book has 51 chapters. <laughs> so, you know, it would, be, it would be an injustice that I could possibly do it to try to, to give it all to you uh, in one lecture. I, I, what, what, the way that I went through my process is that I actually uh, read the chapter and then I asked myself, what is, the, what is the lesson that it's teaching? And then I asked myself, what would that lesson be for and what was the result of it? So Anacito uh, actually arrives at this, this place and that he um, is uh, interacting with Andre. And in that interaction, something that, that Andre describes is this uh, gentleness and, and a, a peace that he's sensing. And um, Anacito is actually a, a much more elevated spirit. And, and he's just making a connection and an identification with uh, Andre. And, and it's just like the humility, because we think of Jesus and Jesus being on earth. You know, he was a very highly elevated spirit who had to change his, his spiritual body in order to materialize on this earth. And so a lot of the communications on these different levels are happening at, like that. So it talks, he, you know, he talks a lot about the, the work that's being done there and the self-sacrifice, which is really not a self-sacrifice because of so much is given in exchange. And uh, 
and the charity and the spirit of service, uh, which is really he takes us into the Messenger Center. And some of you might, might remember the Messenger Center from the first book, which was Nasolar. And, and I remember it because I remember when uh, Andre Luis arrived at the, at the Messenger Center and he saw this uh, scene, which was uh, an open communication to the lo his loved ones. Like he could see that there was an open dialogue happening. And, uh, and it, maybe that was his naive perception because at the, it, it's actually uh, the messenger center is the ministry of communication. And what is happening is that they are receiving prayers, the sentiments and the emotions and the feelings that are vibrating from, from earth in prayer by people who love these, these individuals that have, have passed. And, and Vice versa, the, the, the uh, spiritual realm also sending vibrations and energy. So uh, here he learns about the fact that this is a ground for teaching and that it's actually a training uh, opportunity for him where he has assistance and guidance and, and he gets to learn about uh, mediumship. And for, for those of you who may not be familiar with me mediumship, I, 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 I can't say that I'm uh, well versed in it, but I try to relate to the things that I know. And, and Jesus, I, I see as a medium. You know, he was an elevated spirit who knew exactly his mission, his purpose, his focus. But there are other, other uh, mediums that have been on this earth. Um, I think of uh, Buddha, I think of Muhammad, I think of... Uh, the saints, I think of the archangels, I think of so many good spirits that have uh, uh, had some level of sensitivity and have come here to teach us. Um, we go to uh, Vincent's story, which uh, we get to uh, see a little bit about the um, life, the timeline of life and what actu actually happens. And Vincent was a spirit uh, who I believe was a doctor, if I'm not mistaken, was it? Yes. Uh, and, um, and he had a great uh, passion for research. And so he incarnated in, in uh, life and he was so involved in his work and he had a wife, Rosalinda, and uh, she was also involved in his work for a while. And then I think as their family began to grow, things started to shift. And, and so she wanted to spend more time at home taking care of the household for them. And uh, so they sort of, in, in some ways, sort of separated in, in the amount of time that they were spending. And at the same time, uh, what was interesting is that his brother needed a place to stay. And his brother came and, and uh, stayed with them. Um, so in the course of his staying there, uh, he, his brother brought with him a lot of lower uh, vibration, I don't know, inclinations, affinities, and, and uh, he was, had an attraction to his wife, his brother's wife, and, and end up, ended up falling in love with his, his wife. And um, they, slowly that shift begins to happen because she's with him so, so much and she falls prey to and, and weak to, that, to what was happening. Um, but what happens in the end of this is, is that uh, he's actually, he's dying. And he's in this process of dying and he's there with him. And, and it's, it still seems sort of loving. But after he disincarnates, he, he, he realizes what has happened. And that is that um, his brother has done this. His wife has, has also, you know, transgressed on, on agreements that they, they've had. And that, um, uh, you know, that he has this, this realization. And, and I think about, like, how painful that must have been. And, and, and also, beyond that, that they, they had conspired for his demise. They had actually planted a virus from like he was a researcher, so they, it was not, they, they had access to it. And, and I think they planted it in his food, if I'm not mistaken. 
in his nose, in his nose. It was, yeah, some way. And, and um, you know, I mean, it's just like you see, see the, this and you see how uh, the lessons that come from that and that everything is, is interesting when, it, when it's good, right? When we have good relationships. When I have good relationships, I'm happy, the world is bright, and everything is beautiful. And in those same relationships, I have had different days. And, and in those different days, maybe they weren't as bright. Maybe they were a little darker, you know. <laughs> but, like, how did that change my overall focus? Uh, because what happens is when, when, as things are systemic in nature, and as we are all connected, uh, when one thing shifts, then another thing shifts. And we see the agreements that were made in matrimony between the husband and wife. We see the bloodline ties between the brother. And, and, and then we see the continuation. So this brings us to a perfect uh, crossroad of, of the uh, agreements that we, we make when we come here. So before we even come to earth, in this body, like spiritually, there are agreements that, that, we, that are made. And, and some spirits, especially if they've come with a very highly elevated message, but we all come with blessings and gifts. And we all come with a responsibility for our evolution and learning and growing and, and, and moving beyond the lower vibrations of our uh, existence. So somebody who has a very high level of mediumship obviously has a very high level of responsibility because it, it is so deeply connected with other people's healing and, um, and the mission that they have, the purpose that they have. Uh, so we can imagine uh, what, would happen, what would be a consequence if for some reason they didn't uh, make that mission. And what we find in, in the uh, messengers is that we get an insight into what are some of the profound warnings that, that happen. And so our, our overall mental well-being in relationship to our physical well-being and spiritual well-being are, are all united. And, and there's the profound warnings which, that uh, when things are out of balance, insanity, misery, tragedy, diseases, sexual compulsivity, suicide, an unbalanced life, marital conflict, and family separation. And I don't, you know, maybe for some of us, this seems very far removed. It seems pretty close for me. I had a friend who just passed away of, su of a suicide. And, um, and I, I, I could see the imbalance in, in his life. I want to point out something here about the diseases. You know, diseases can be part of our destiny because, you know, maybe part of God's greater divine plan that we somehow endure this. Uh, but we can have an impact on our overall longevity. So our, 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 our mental harmonization and balance will affect our physical immune system and, our, and, and the balance. So it would thereby shorten the length by keeping us, if we were under a lot of stress and anxiety. And, um, and then marital conflict and family, uh, I don't know. You could just relate that back to your relationships. But I think that we all have a point of, of, uh, of understanding. And so then the next thing we find is Octavio's fall for uh, those that have been given much, much will be expected. And uh, in relationships, in relationship to Octavio, who was a highly elevated medium, coming with uh, a, a, an extreme amount of knowledge and blessings, and he had a really big spiritual duty because he also brought with him uh, six other uh, spirits to support this work. And, uh, and in his uh, mediumship, was, was here to help and, and with all this assistance. But he had uh, succumbed to, to, 
like the material world and, and he shifted and, and he started to disregard his mediumship. And um, in the end, he ended up, he's the one that had the sexuality thing, right? He's the one that uh, was not supposed to get married, but he had Yeah, he had the six spirits. So, so the, the failure of the mission, you can see like, like six other spirits, not to mention all of the people that they would have been helping have been, been impacted by the failure of that, of that mission. So that was just a, a powerful insight to see. And the next uh, message that, that we see is, uh, is Asselino's I, I hope I pronounced that right. My, the, I had the greatest difficulty just with the, the names. Um, Asselino's tragedy is that each, each one of us it has to experience what is uh, appropriate. And he came here with a very high level of mediumship. And the way that he disregarded that was that incarnate spirits around him were telling him that he could utilize these blessings and gifts to make money, to profit. And, 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 you know, I think about the gifts that I've received here, and I think about the gifts that I would share with somebody, and I have a great responsibility in, in one, sharing it, because it's been given to me, and I, I, ha I have that, so it's like I, you offer it to the next person, uh, and you certainly don't um, diminish the gift by, by bringing a material gain to it. So uh, his story sort of brought that to life. Uh, I don't know why this is going this way, but we'll just move through it. You get a chance to really digest <laughs> it. So next is listening to impressions. And um, one of my favorite si uh, Things is sacred silence writes the universe. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, you know, in prayer and meditation, we we find a, a connection to something higher than where we are, and uh, it's it's from that silence, from that listening, uh, is where we might begin to start to find healing in our life. But I, th I think the greater thing is like when we're, when we're w with some other people, whether it's our family, whether it's our friends, or whether it's people that, strangers that we might be helping, or, um, you know, it's, it's sort of like from that level of, of listening and that level of sacred silence that we're present with each other. You know, where, where I'm not looking to provide you an answer because really we're, we're here to bear witness for each other. And, and one of the other interesting things to note about all of these mediumships is, is these spirits are, are on earth helping us, but they are on earth helping themselves. You know, it's like they have their own evolution and, and responsibility in addition to tr being helpful to these others. So th I thought that that was a very important point to note. And uh, this is Bellarmino, the uh, instructor. And Bellarmino, the instructor, uh, talks about like the, uh, uh, just the experience of, of being in, in uh, a situation where he's sharing information and getting a chance to be able to listen to other people that he says, really the, the uh, the instructor is the one that it benefits the most because the instructor enriches themselves through the observations and deepens uh, their level of, of experience. And so in order to be that type of person, we need to have a, a lot of discipline. Uh, what is it? So somebody, uh, I think maybe even she go, discipline, discipline, discipline? Yeah. Was it? Yeah. yeah. You know, I tell myself that all the time, you know, and, and I try and I really apply that in a committed way. You know, in some of the, some of the things that I, I do, I come here as a commitment to myself for my healing because I know how fragile uh, my mental state could become. 
And you never know when these shifts are, are going to happen. So this is, is something that sustains me. It's like a food uh, of my spiritual nature. And, and he talks about the guidance that we have and the uh, other teachers and the process of reincarnation, which is the beautiful story. It's almost a story of forgiveness that we have, we have a second chance. Not a second chance that we shouldn't pay attention to this one, but that we're going to get a chance to improve if that's the path that we are choosing. And if we do not, then we're going we're gonna, to uh, you know, have the profound warnings happen for, for us. So the giving and receiving is also, I think, something that was re that's really beautiful because I'm sure that each of you in your own way have experienced occasions where, where you were with somebody and maybe it was something you said or maybe it was something that you did for them and it wasn't that you said anything that they probably had heard before or had done anything that somebody else hadn't done. It was just your way of, that, of doing it. And that person received it. And, and you were conscious and present to that reception. And you were conscious and present to being a witness to that. So that is the beauty. Is like I find that in, in those few moments that I have experienced where I've had, to, I've had that exchange, is that it has really given my life meaning. And it has given my life purpose. And, um, and maybe you find this the same. So preparations, you know, so like to, to constantly be preparing ourselves at every level, you know, so whether we're preparing ourselves in, in our home life outside of the center or we're preparing ourselves here within the center, there are preparations being done on the spiritual uh, level for us and that we are responsible for, for acting on here. And, more, you know, so we really need to uncover the things, the layers that we have placed around ourselves. And we need to discover the truth about where we are in relationship to where we're going. And, and, and to let go of the things that don't serve us any longer. Because, you know, like some things have a value in the moment, but they, have a, they don't have an intrinsic value always. It was then, not now. You know? So it's good to, to uh, reassess where we are. And, and, and the spiritual realm, in terms of the assistance that's provided for us, is always doing that. Uh, Angie asked me, you, you know, we were talking about, about the aid station, and, and so it's this place, it's like a, it's a fortress is the way that it's described. So, uh, you know, Nasalar is here, and then there's the aid station, and, and then, you know, down here, there's a lot of other things happening on the lower zones. So the lower zones would represent, like, what, what is below. But what is in that fortress is, is like kept safe. And that, you know, it is here where all this is happening in this aid station where this regeneration and, um, and uh, these, high, th these spirits are helping to assist for the, the mediumship that's going to occur. And I just think that the Christ the Redeemer couldn't be a better example of that. You know, Brazil is one of my... my favorite places because I experienced a shift in my perception based on the energy that I was present to while I was first there. And, um, and you know, I went to Christ the Redeemer, which is overwhelming, you know, to see in person. But the richness of the beauty, of the natural beauty, is, is a reflection of, of just like God's goodness. And... Um, but the aid station is just where, where we have so many higher, uh, higher elevated spirits that are working on our behalf and that care about us and that are guiding us and, and are showing us the way if we will allow them. So it also describes information and explanations. So the law of action and reaction, 
if we don't, if we are not able to fulfill our spiritual duties, you know, there, there is a consequence to that. You know, if we, if we are able to, to fulfill our spiritual duties, there is a consequence to that, which is good. Uh, but, you know, they're all, they're all, even when we experience pain in, in life as a result of some of the things that maybe we have struggled to learn, um, that pain isn't there for our suffering. The pain is there to expand us into love, to be able to uh, help us to find uh, the ability, the capacity, the strength. And, and so this is just talking about that. But if there's a shift, God's going to take care of it. You know, He's going to cover it because He's got a divine plan. You're a piece of that plan. And if you should shift, He will make the adjustments, but you will also shift everything around you in addition to your own, your own experience. And then there's the you know, rectification, and, and, and uh, there's a passage that reads, uh, and, and God breathed life into man. And uh, so breathing with the intention of relieving or healing is significant because it's something that we all contain. Like we all have the ability to do that. And the breath is also pretty awesome. <laughs> One, because it like, gives us life. You know, I think about the first <coughs> breath that we take, the first conscious breath that we take, you know, which is where this incarnation begins. And the last breath that we take uh, you know, is when, we're, when, we, when we pass. And we are not the first breath and we're not the last breath because we are the formless. We are the, our spirit. And, and, uh, but breathing life and, and inhaling and exhaling life is important. And, and I think that this is just talking about the energies that are sort of... Uh, that we experience here. And, and you think about the passes that we go through. You know, they're just like an energetic transfer. And, and also, they require a state of mind, a state of openness in, in, in us. So the defenses uh, against evil, what would help us to defend ourselves against evil? And, you know, again, this is... Uh, Prayer, prayer, we pray for the things that, that we need in order to strengthen ourselves. And, and then when we sit in that quiet place and, and we get an intuition or we have somebody that appears in our day or a stranger that does something that sort of, it's, it's the message. We've got to listen for that message. So uh, there's an action that we have to take after the prayer and then there's that consistency because I think that in coming here and doing all these things, if I do something spiritual that nourishes me in a good way, it raises my vibration. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to do something messed up when I get here. <laughs> it just means I'm going to have a higher, higher propensity to be aware of it and, and to be able to readjust. So the consistency is really important because like we were talking about the good relationships and bad relationships, you know, it's subjective. So we want to have money in the bank. And this is like the depository. And, and if we need to withdraw some money to cover this, we'll have that. We'll have that. And then when we think of prayer, uh, there's a chapter which is Amalia's prayer. And Amalia is this highly elevated spirit. Um, and um, it talks about when she starts speaking, that the words sort of fall away, and that people that are in the, in the meeting and in the, in the messenger center uh, just sort of like all fall into the same pace, the same rhythm, the same balance. And, and, it's, and it's, uh, it's just like the connection of her as a very highly elevated spirit in her heart to what is being said that other people are able to relate to. 
And what are the effects of, of prayer? You know, and I think of the parable of the sower, and you always do such a great job of telling that story. Because I think about the seeds that we plant, and, and we think about a seed in the darkness, as he, he explained. And, and in, it's in that darkness that we are actually born, and that something grows, and that, that from that little seed reaches up into something else and produces fruit. So we have to think about what, what are the seeds that we're sowing today. And, and it may not give us fruit today, but we have to, we have to prepare for that. And, and I think that, that, that that's one of the effects of what we're doing with uh, prayer. And then another one of the chapters uh, is uh, the slanderer. And the slanderer says, uh, don't attack the children of God. And I think of the sweet and bitter fruits that fall from our mouths, you know, and I think of, uh, who was it, uh, was it Gandhi that, that had said, uh, if you can't do good, then just try to do no harm, you know, and, and uh, our job in life, I believe, is to comfort, console, and encourage I have to think about, like, when, I, when I'm going someplace, especially to do something like this, what is, it, what is the purpose of it? Who is it for? And then how does that happen? And in what ways? Because when I think about it from the outside in, it's a total shift. When I think about what I'm doing and how I'll do it and, and why, it changes the whole dynamic. So, you know, we come to places like this. This is sort of a nasalar for me in a lot of ways. Um, you know, it's where I, I have I, I found a beginning. It's not that I didn't have uh, these teachings in my life. It was that that uh, really, honestly, like Angie as a as a messenger connected with me through the internet. You know, I was here in in physical in the physical one time. But because of her action, a stranger you know, that took the time to communicate with me in the way that she communicated, which seemed to me very heartfelt. You know, when I, I came back into the city, I, I immediately came back to the center. I did it for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, I was in a relationship with somebody who brought me to the center. And in a lot of ways, the energy that I was present to here was reminiscent. Um, but there was a, a more beautiful energy that I stayed for, you know, and, and, and there are all these teachings which, uh, like, are, are so far beyond what I can really articulate, uh, but that somehow now I'm, I'm, I'm having a greater understanding because I take these things back home, like, like I, I'm a squirrel with a nut that takes it back home and tries to figure out well, this is what we talked about in the meeting. Now, how does this show up in my life? Like, where is this in my life? Um, because I have to connect with it in, in my own life, or it, it's just a teaching that lives in my head and it serves no, no value. So I think that what, the work that is done here on a spiritual level and that is done in any other spiritual uh, teaching, you know, life is a spiritual teaching. Uh, we come to this uh, story of this mother, uh, the mother and child. So this mother, who is also a highly elevated spirit, they're all highly elevated spirits, uh, has four children and, and three daughters and a, a son. And um, it's, it's a conversation where the mother is, is talking to them and, and the little girl, they're very impoverished, they live in Rio, and um, the little girl's asking about food, why they only eat once a day, and all the other people around them are having all these meals. And, and her mother reflects it back to her in the abundance of, of her life and how, uh, how uh, n not to be wasteful, like how they're using what they need. And, and the son uh, begins to uh, chime in because he has a, an idea. They have a room where they, where they practice the gospel, where they do a spiritual study at home. 
And, and, and his idea is that somebody from the, the village is interested in renting that room, that they could utilize that money and they could buy, the thi they could buy things that they need. I, I connected to his good intention because it reminds me a lot of myself, maybe. Uh, and then, you know, she lovingly like, tells him why. And, and the father created this practice and this space, this sacred space. And, and uh, she, so she's really get, trying to get him to um, have a realization of the spiritual values versus the material values, which is, you can imagine, challenging for a little boy who doesn't have a lot and sees other people with stuff. Uh, but there's a, a very interesting clip that I want to show you that comes from the movie that uh, it's called God's Not Dead. And, and this woman in this, in this video actually has dementia. And, and she receives this mediumistic opportunity only for a moment. What? Oh. Now? Okay. Can you hear? You prayed to leave your whole life. Never done anything wrong. And here you are. You're the nicest person I know. I'm the meanest. You have dementia. My life is perfect. Explain that to me. Sometimes the devil allows people to live a life free of trouble. Because he doesn't want them turning to God. Your sin is like a jail cell accepted. That's a powerful message, <laughs> you know, and, and this is a, a mother, you know, and, and that, that for whatever reason was inspired and this, and this message comes through and it's just a, it's interesting to see her son who has so much in the world and, and yet is so disconnected from this part of himself and, and yet they're connected, you know, so. Uh, So I think of our homes as, as such a sacred space because it's the place of regeneration. It's the place where we uh, rest and the place where we renew and we rebuild and we get ready to face uh, the world. And, and, and so that's, that space I consider to be sacred. And um, I, I think you guys helped me to, to really realize that, to honor my, my space as a sacred space. And, and I began to shift my energy there at home and to let go of things that, that maybe had a lot of old energy in it and uh, to bring things into my home that were more spiritual and, and it has changed the atmosphere and I'm in that atmosphere and so I'm affected by, by that atmosphere and so it does matter matter in the way that it's material and that it affects me spiritually. And, and, and you know, if, if we go out in the world and our home is in a place where we've rested and it's not a place where we re renewed and then we're 
trying to defend ourselves against evil, you know, and, and New York is a great uh, melding pot because we have lots of opportunities to practice our, our spiritual connection, <laughs> you know, on the subway, uh, you know, going up and down stairs, whatever it is, you know, there's just a lot of times where you really, you have to be aware and you have to, maybe, well, you don't have to, but you can, you can do this and it makes the city a little bit nicer. I think when you run at the pace of life, when I don't connect to a, a higher vibration before I go out the door, then I fall into the energy of what's on the street. So we always are receiving assistance. You know, God is always looking out for us. We have our guardian angel. Um, you know, there's so much goodness being done on our behalf. And we, all we need to do is to begin to connect with it. Um, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on this, but the d dread of death is, is like just part of, like we, the, the fear that we have of, uh, as, as human beings of death. And, and, and it, a lot of it comes from thinking that this is it. If I, if I believe that this is it, then I want to take it all I can get while I'm here, right? And, and so the idea of, not, of going into nothing seems kind of scary. Uh, and then there's Fernando's demise and, and, and he's not able to leave. And so it, there's also, you know, obviously a lot of assistance that's in there, in, in the room with them as well. And they have to make the intercession in order to facilitate that process. But it's, it's just beautiful in the way that we think about, like when you go to visit somebody who's in the hospital and the energy that you bring, you're a consoler. And so you're there to encourage them in whatever they're doing, not in the way that I want you to be well, but in the way that it, it's okay, whatever's happening is okay, and I'm here with you, you know? And, and you know, saying goodbye is, is really just the uh, uh, ascension itself. But you know, I come back to uh, what is the message? You know, that each one of our lives is a living letter of, of God's goodness. And, and um, you know, that is written into our heart. And when we are carrying that message from our heart into the world, others recognize it because it, they recognize their heart. And uh, I think that each one of us here are like a pearl, you know, and, and pearls go through a process and, and all unique and all different. So I, this is just a little clip to give you a... A pearl is created by an oyster or mollusk, quite by accident. It's so hot. Pearl-producing oysters are simple creatures that languish in water and feed on plankton. Occasionally, while the mollusks passively feed, a grain of sand or parasite will lodge itself inside the soft inner body of the oyster, causing its host great discomfort. Unable to expel the intruder, the oyster engages a defense mechanism within its body to protect itself from the intruder. The oyster begins to secrete a smooth, hard, crystalline substance around the intruder in order to protect itself. This substance is calcium carbonate based and is commonly referred to as nacre. As long as the intruder remains <clears throat> within its body, the oyster will continue to deposit nacre around it, layer upon layer. After a few years, the intruder will be totally encased in a smooth and lustrous cocoon of nacre, which has now become a pearl. But how precious pearls are formed from what an oyster regards as merely protection against irritation is one of nature's most prized secrets. For all this technology and science, man is still unable to recreate this phenomenon outside of an oyster. For nacre is not just a soothing substance. It is composed of millions of microscopic crystals, each aligned perfectly so that light passing along the axis of one is reflected and refracted by the other to produce a tapestry of light and color. So 
you know, each of us has uh, gone through whatever challenges, whatever suffering that you've experienced or, or whatever joy, whatever happiness, but all of those experiences make up the uniqueness that you are, you know, and the beauty of your life and the blessing of your life and the gift that you have to share with the world. And the common thread that runs through all of us is God's goodness. <laughs> It is what holds us together that makes us this beautiful and exquisite, like, necklace, you know? It's just, I, I really think that each of us have, have a, a, like, I'm not here with you by chance. <laughs> You're not here with me by chance. And we're learning from each other and we're growing together. And, and it's in this uh, brother-sisterhood that uh, I really feel this fraternal, element you're not I, you, I didn't grow up with you but I wouldn't know the difference you know so I want to say thank you I have just like tapped the surface of, of some of this book there are so many nuances that give you insights into where you are in relationship to your unique journey that I encourage you to explore the book because it's a really amazing piece of work and, and it was a lot to digest. And I thought, how the heck am I going to talk about it? You know, because there's just so much. Each one could be a lecture on, unto itself. So I want to say thank you for being patient with me and listening to me and just being here with me.